Deadly Premonition is a game that by all accounts shouldn't work. It's clunky with odd controls that don't always feel the best. Its tone shifts all over the place, and at points it feels awkward and uneven. It can be difficult to play in the modern age, trying to find a version that doesn't have a ton of negatives to it. But despite all of these things, it manages to succeed. This is primarily because of the unique concept, interesting narrative, and ambitious gameplay. The game takes a lot of inspiration from media like Twin Peaks, something that we'll definitely get into shortly. And while it can take way too much from other sources at times, it travels down its own path eventually. With a head start from its inspirations, it carves out its own place in history, a unique space in the gaming medium that it's fully laid out for itself. The game's story resembles Twin Peaks, the town and daily life feel like Shenmue, but at the end of the day, the game isn't anything but deadly premonition. The first few hours of the experience will definitely have you feeling like you've seen this before, but once you sink some time into it, you'll truly feel like this is something special, something unique. In an article reviewing Sweary, Deadly Premonition's director, Philip Kolar says this, The tide shifted slowly but surely, with more and more reviewers succumbing to Deadly Premonition's charms, the positive reviews didn't ignore the game's many flaws, how could they? but rather saw past them. Enjoying Deadly Premonition isn't about pretending that the flaws of the game don't exist, it's about seeing past them. They really don't make games like this anymore, and Deadly Premonition feels like something that has soul. It feels like something that was made with intention, with purpose, with feeling. Because of that, we're going to be taking a deep dive into this game today. We'll be taking a look at gameplay, mechanics, and everything in between. Spoilers for Deadly Premonition. Hey Dad, it's me, your favorite son, and I'd like to talk about Deadly Premonition. Deadly Premonition, or Red Seed's profile as it's known in Japan, originally started out under a completely different name, Rainy Woods. The game was revealed at TGS in 2007. The game was criticized at the time for both its look and its similarity to the television show Twin Peaks. This, combined with the technical complications with creating the game for both PS2 and Xbox 360, led the designers back to the drawing board, and the game was rebooted as Deadly Premonition, or Red Seed's profile in Japan. The game was directed by Hidetaka Suihiro, or as he's more commonly known, Swery65. Swery65 had been working on games since the late 90s at SNK, but he eventually grew tired of working for someone else and wanted to start his own team. This is when he created Access Games. Their first game, Spy Fiction, was released to poor reception, and most critics drew comparisons to Metal Gear Solid, but not in a good way. The team took a long time before developing their next release. They felt that the long time off from game development gave them an eagerness and a drive to create something special. The project really started when Tomio Kanazawa reached out to Swery because he liked his work on spy fiction. With the reboot of the game, the main protagonist was completely revamped and recreated. Also, the next generation PlayStation console in that of the PS3 had been released. This created tons of new complications that the team had to deal with. Because of the large amount of RAM that the system had, the team became overzealous with their ambitions. This created massive problems with data allocation. In addition to this, the team had problems with lighting, shadows, and the graphics system in general. They struggled to try and achieve a consistent frame rate and it ate up lots of their time. An area that the team didn't struggle on though was the story. The world was handcrafted and Swery himself felt that the most important part of the game was creating a town that was realistic. The team visited America for data collection, taking pictures and notes about small towns to try and make something that players could live in. The NPCs in the game were given full profiles with details that ranged from simple, like birthdays, to incredibly complex, like the time they had their first kiss. 
The ultimate goal for the town was to smear the boundary between reality and dream. During development, the game was also cancelled multiple times. It was a miracle that it was even released to the public. Deadly Premonition originally didn't have any combat systems, but producers eventually intervened because they thought that the game wouldn't sell in western markets without the inclusion of guns. Deadly Premonition was released for the Xbox 360 in North America on February 23rd, 2010, and in Japan for the PlayStation 3 and the Xbox 360 on March 11th, 2010. Before we get into discussing the game and my time with it, I have a few notes that I'd like to briefly talk about. First is about the length of this review. Deadly Premonition is a very deep game. And while that is true in terms of narrative and character, I primarily mean that in reference to the amount of content that exists in this game. Deadly Premonition has a main story, it has many side stories, and many side activities, but there are also tons of little details that you won't see if you just breeze through the game. It requires multiple playthroughs, chapter replays, and close examination to provide a full picture of the story and the game at hand. Because of that, I will be dedicating a lot of time to talking about this game, and there's a lot here to dissect. The other note that I have is on external media. I watched and consumed some other media that I'll be talking about in this review. This is because Deadly Premonition is a game that is heavily influenced by other things, especially film and television. I obviously watched Twin Peaks, again, for this review. This is something we'll get very in-depth with later in the video, but it's integral that you have seen the show before fully dissecting this game. I also watched Brazil, a film by Terry Gilliam. This is because Swery specifically points this out as a huge influence on the game. He also referenced the Coen brothers, Woody Allen, and Sam Raimi, so I rewatched a smattering of their films as well. I also rewatched the first few seasons of The X Files in preparation for this video, half because of points that I will make later, and half because I wanted to watch The X Files again. All of this media in some way makes up Deadly Premonition, and like I said before, this is a massive point of this review that I will get into far more in depth later in this video. The final note that I have is on the version of Deadly Premonition that I played. There are a ton of different versions of the game that were released. Originally, the game was released on PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 in Japan, but was only released on the Xbox 360 in the West. Eventually, the director's cut version of the game was released that added some things and allowed those in the West to play the game on PS3. This version included a new prologue to the game and a new epilogue, both that framed the story of the game differently and set the game up for a sequel. The controls were overhauled, addressing massive complaints that most had with the original version of the game. The difficulty was changed, the map was fixed, certain items were changed, small details on cars, graphics upgraded, audio was balanced, the leaderboards were removed, higher res textures. It was a complete overhaul of the entire project. Now, these extra cutscenes aren't exactly canon because they were removed from the eventual Switch version of the game released in 2019. The Switch version was called Deadly Premonition Origins and has its own slew of issues. The long and short of this is that no version of Deadly Premonition is actually the single best one that you can play. They all have their drawbacks. The original Xbox 360 version can have awkward controls, a green hue, and bloom. Some people could prefer these things and they may identify with the original style more. The Director's Cut PS3 version has a different control scheme and no green filter but has a ton of bugs, low frame rate, pop-in issues, and a washed out look. The Director's Cut PC version barely works at all, having tons of crashes and issues running in general. The Switch version has the same problems as the Director's Cut, worse sound issues, and more bugs. Now, the version that I decided to play was the PS3 Director's Cut, but I emulated it on RPCS3, the main PS3 emulator available. This basically gets rid of most of the bugs from the original Director's Cut version of the game, while still including the extra non-canon scenes from that version. I will be talking about these scenes, but making it clear when we're talking about scenes that probably were retconned later. Again, I did my research, but did not play every single version of this game, as it wasn't my intention to create a definitive list of each and every problem with all the ports. 
I also just want to briefly shout out the Welcome to Greenvale website. I've linked that site below. It is a fantastic resource on Deadly Premonition and has quite an exhaustive list of information about the game that was very useful in my research for this project. Without further ado, let's talk about Deadly Premonition. Deadly Premonition technically begins with a scene of a grandfather beginning to tell a story to his granddaughter. This is the first of the extra scenes included with the director's cut version of the game. Again, these are seemingly not canon at this point because the most recent version of the game, Deadly Premonition Origins, that was released on the Switch, does not include these scenes. That being said, in the interest of being comprehensive, I still wanted to play a version of the game that included these scenes. This is the framing device for the game. The story that we will see, the one that plays out, is the one that is being told to this girl. He says something very important to the story here, something that will come up down the line. Now, listen. This is important. At times, we must purge things from this world because they should not exist. Even if it means losing someone that you love. We then see our main character, York, who we've yet to formally meet, inside of the Red Room, a mysterious place that we'll become familiar with over the course of the story. Two childlike angels sit in this room, whispering to each other. We can inspect some things here, a map, a clock, a TV. The angels then tell York that they are sorry to have kept him waiting, but it's time to get started. We then are officially introduced to York. We'll also know him by his full name, Francis York Morgan. He will introduce himself to many characters throughout the story in the exact same way every time. FBI Special Agent Francis York Morgan. Please, just call me York. That's what everyone calls me. FBI Special Agent Francis York Morgan. Please, call me York. FBI Special Agent Francis York Morgan. Morgan. Please, just call me York. It's what everyone else calls me. York is a special guy, an eccentric character that is utterly himself at every turn. We'll come to know him a lot better, but for now, he's in a car, driving in the rain. He's talking on the phone to someone about something that's seemingly important. We then realize it's very trivial when it's revealed that he's talking about the show Tom and Jerry. Proof? Well, in the Tom and Jerry show, they live with each other. Hello? Hello? York loses signal on his phone, and this conversation is cut short. It's also worth noting that York is driving, having a phone call, and using his laptop to look at crime scene photos all at the same time. These pictures are a part of his job, as York is an FBI agent, but this isn't exactly the safest method of driving that I've ever seen. This comes back to bite him pretty quickly because a figure appears in the road and York crashes into the forest. We're then given control of our main character and have to make our way out of the woods. We can pick up some melee weapons, use our service pistol, and make our way through the forests. As we head into the woods, we can see a strange substance at the edge of this area, blocking our path. This shows us that we've been transported to the other world, a place where we actually have to fight the denizens of this plane. These take the form of grotesque monsters that try to attack us. It's probably about time that we talk about the combat of Deadly Premonition. There isn't exactly a lot here, to be honest. Outside of boss battles, most of the combat is basically the same for the entire game. We will go up against monsters that basically act as bullet sponges. We can either use melee weapons to deal with them up close and personal, or ranged weapons to stick back and take enemies out from far away. There are a variety of each type of weapon. Melee weapons can consist of small knives, pipes, bars, and even a legendary guitar that can rip through crowds. The melee weapons can be pretty powerful and just take out most enemies with one hit. Melee weapons also have their own durability rating, and after that rating goes down, we won't be able to use them again. But we can complete side objectives to get infinite versions of these weapons that never break. Certain ones already have the infinite modifier and will never be destroyed. 
Even just a simple infinite wrench can basically take care of every enemy that we come in contact with. This makes even some of the earliest weapons incredibly overpowered. The infinite wrench that I got pretty early on into the game basically carried me through most of my experience. There also really isn't any challenge or variety to any of the combat. We basically deal with most every enemy exactly the same, especially when it comes to melee. There is a slight variety in that some weapons will have different speeds or styles of attack, but it's not nearly enough to carry the entire system on its back. Ranged weapons can be even worse. There is a variety here as well. We can get shotguns, assault rifles, and pistols. There's a difference here in each weapon, the damage that it does and the way that it's used. But the only time ranged weapons feel useful is in the beginning. When we're just starting out, it feels like we have to get headshots. We're aiming with purpose because enemies can be bullet sponges. If we just load bullets into them, then they'll take a while to go down. Actually taking our time and getting two shots to the head with the starter pistol will take enemies out quickly. Deadly Premonition is definitely considered a horror game by most people, but I wouldn't say it's a through and through horror game. That being said, it can be pretty intense and creepy. The sound design is very well done, and the sounds that the enemies make can be intimidating. <laughs> They feel very foreign, like they don't come from this place because they seemingly don't. They feel alien and like their plane of origin is completely unknown to us. The slow pace at which they crawl towards the player, our surroundings being warped, and the fact that we have to trudge into the unknown all make Deadly Premonition something that I would definitely call horror. When enemies creep towards us, it feels like every shot matters, at least in the beginning. Once the game advances on a bit and we start to gain other weapons, especially ones that are infinite, this feature of combat is completely removed. This was especially true for me once I got the infinite SMG. This again was pretty early on in the game, but it basically negated ranged weapons. They no longer became a part of sequences that generated terror and fear, intensity, but something that was just a toll to move through bodies. These bodies also were no longer a representation of something that could take me out, or something that could get in close and scare me. It was just a body. This is the biggest problem with combat, is that once we've gained a few upgrades, only a couple of hours into the game, even the smallest ounces of heft that the system carried are now gone. There's nothing in this system that evolves throughout the game. Later in the game we will encounter monsters that wield melee weapons, but they really just require one more shot to take down. They will also get ranged weapons later, which slightly complicates combat, but by the time we get here, we probably already have good infinite weapons and can take out enemies before they even have a chance to fire. There is one other type of enemy that's introduced, but we'll talk about that once we get there, because it happens pretty late in the game. All of these things combine to create a combat system that just genuinely feels like an afterthought. The reason for this is because it was an afterthought. Like I said before, the developers didn't even plan to have a combat system in the game, but the publishers determined that it was necessary to sell the game to Western audiences. And to be honest, the game really doesn't need it. There are needless amounts of combat scenes sequences in the game that just make the thing drag on. They provide no challenge, no difficulty, they just really aren't anything. They act as an obstacle, but overcoming the obstacle only requires time, not skill. That being said, this is the version of the game that doesn't have a difficulty level, there are no settings in the director's cut, and the developers themselves stated that the difficulty here was somewhere in between the easy and the normal modes of the original game. Either way, the difficulty should be massively raised because it's just way too easy. Though this wouldn't change the poor design choices, it would at least make things a little bit harder for a little bit longer. Again, though the whole system is plagued by the problem of simplicity, it walks down the path of the dull rather than the one of the fascinating. As York travels through the forest, we are forced to restart generators to open gates and get out of this place. He is eventually accosted by the same figure that he saw on the road, the Raincoat Killer. This is our antagonist for this game and the person behind the killings in Greenvale, but York doesn't catch him quite yet. This is only the beginning of our story. As York makes it out of the woods, he arrives at the bridge to his meeting with the Deputy Sheriff, Emily Wyatt. 
She says that the sheriff of Greenvale actually went out into the woods to look for York. York also is immediately taken by Emily's appearance and thinks she's easy on the eyes. The sheriff himself then shows up, George Woodman. He is very weary of York, as he doesn't trust city cops. He's generally abrasive towards outsiders to the town in general. They seem to have built their own sanctuary here, and they don't want people intruding. You don't have a problem with this, do you? No. No problem? Just want to set things straight. Our small town has its share of problems. I'm the one fixing them one by one, and maintaining peace and order. York explains that he's here to look for the killer because he matches the profile of many other killers that York has caught, ones that target young women specifically. Before he leaves, George gives York some advice, to appreciate the town and the wildlife that they have, as it's a special place. York states that he's been transported back to the Middle Ages, and he's just met the king. The thing we haven't really talked about here yet is Zack. Zack is someone that York talks to a lot. This character is seemingly in his head as he places his finger on his ear whenever he speaks to him. Zack, let's reassess the situation. There are no cavemen here. We're as far forward as the Middle Ages. And we've just met the king. He's definitely not another person, and at this point in the game, we just really don't know what to think about him. For a while, we might even think that York is a bit insane, talking to someone in his own mind, reflecting on the events around him, but this also plays into York's eccentricity and makes him slightly endearing as well. Once we begin to see that York is actually very competent at his job, then this becomes a character trait rather than some sort of flaw. After this, we see another cutscene of the grandfather telling this story. They talk about loving movies, and York is once again back in the Red Room. As he makes his way through one of the doors, he finds a young boy who helps him maneuver around a monster that's in his way. We have a pretty intense scene where we have to hold our breath while the two sneak around the monster. When York awakens, realizing that this was just a dream, he notes that he recognizes the boy from somewhere, but he can't place it. When we get downstairs, we meet Polly Oxford, the owner of this hotel. She gives York breakfast as the two sit at a table that is much too far apart to have a reasonable conversation. I couldn't help but notice. Aside from you and me, there seems to be no other guests or workers around. What's that? The salt in that white shaker there. Thank you. I was wondering if there were any other guests or workers here. But the two participate in chit chat anyways. We can get some extra information from Polly here about the town. York then gets a message in his coffee, something that he always listens to, spelling out the letters FK. When York gets outside, the master keys to all of the patrol cars in town are left for him. He is given directions by the sheriff to meet him at the station by 5 o'clock. At this point, we are left to wander. We can explore the entire town if we want, we can go do side quests, we can head to shops, try to find collectibles, or just go down the path of the main story. It probably makes sense to talk about Greenvale, the place that our story takes place in, because the location is probably the biggest character in this tale. Greenvale is a quaint little forest town that sits somewhere inside of Washington. The town has very few residents at this point, but used to have a population somewhere around 6,000, which also is not that large. The place is not your typical rural town, though. It seems to exist somewhere away from the rest of the world, not having evolved into the interconnected modern landscape. York explains this very well right after he gets the keys to the patrol car. This town has what the country needs. Values. It truly can be this paradise that sits away from the rest of the world deep in the woods. We can travel to most of the town right from the start of the game, with the exception of a few small areas that are closed off from us. The main town center holds most of the businesses and residents' homes. We can visit these places as long as they're open. If we head to someone's home and they aren't there, we will see a large closed sign above the door. This is the same for businesses and the nature of the town is reflected in the fact that most of the time, if it's raining, the town basically shuts down. Most of the businesses close and we can't access them that day. 
Everything here works on a schedule. NPCs have their own daily duties. They will head to work, run errands, head home. The things that we can do are completely affected by what time and day it is. The team clearly wanted to put thought and time into Greenvale. The original design was much more cynical and violent, but eventually they realized that they needed to create a sense of reality with the town. Making the place a living, breathing location makes the story a lot more realistic, but it also creates a juxtaposition when the town eventually changes to the other world. Swery talked about three concepts that were very important to the game in multiple different interviews, real time, real scale, and real life. The first of these, real time, is clearly presented by the fact that the game exists in real time. We have a clock on our minimap that represents the current in-game time. We will have certain objectives that we can only complete at certain times, like for example the current mission that York has to meet the sheriff at the Greenvale Police Department. Real time exists also in the schedules of the members of the town. If we want to go see a specific person at their home, they may not be there. They may be at work they may be at the store or fishing. The town does not wait for us. Characters are not sitting around waiting for York to visit them for a mission. At the same time, the time limits on missions are usually not a hard limit. If we want to spend our day wandering around the town and looking for collectibles, then we can. We'll have another opportunity to complete the mission the next day, after we sleep. All of this creates the real-time aspect that Swery talks about. The fact that we have a town that is persistent, that we have to maneuver around Greenvale, it does not bend to us. It is something that has been around that has stayed, and we will not change that. Our presence here, not only as York, but as the player, does not affect it. We are a blip on its timeline. The second major factor in the design of Greenvale is the real scale. The area of the town is pretty large. The limits of what I would consider the actual center of Greenvale is pretty humble though. A few small rows of homes, two bars, a general store, a gun shop, a gas station, a police station, just your average small quaint forest town. But this isn't the only part of Greenvale that we can travel to. Of course, we start at our hotel, which sits on the lake to the north of the town. There's the general hospital, the art gallery, a tree farm, a junkyard, a graveyard, a lumber mill, and all of these locations are pretty spaced out. It can take quite a while just driving from place to place. Of course, later in the game we can receive upgrades to our car, making it faster and increasing the handling, and we can even get a sort of fast travel mechanic. But the scale of the town is certainly real. Travel time is something we genuinely have to consider, especially if we're trying to complete a mission that day. We may have to plan things out to determine if we can travel somewhere to complete a side quest before the location for our main mission closes. Also, traveling about the town so often permanently stamps it into your mind. In the beginning of the game, it's very annoying to have to check the map so often, mostly because the map turns with our orientation, so it can be very difficult to figure out where we are. But eventually, we come to learn the town. We figure out where things are. We know our way around, and we no longer have to check the map to figure out how to get to the milk barn. We just know where it is. This isn't an excuse, because if the root issue was fixed, then we wouldn't have to deal with it at all, but it does exist as both a problem and a nice advantage of having that problem. The final aspect, real life, is just as important as the other two. Real life denotes how the town exists, and how the people of the town exist. The developers created schedules and profiles for each character in the game. They thought up lives for them, details that weren't even used in the actual end product, but they were necessary. Putting this level of depth into each character gave them a real life, a real existence before and after York visits the town. Thinking this far into things also creates a behavior for each character, cascading into a schedule that they can complete even when we aren't watching. This makes every character real in their own special way. They play a role in the larger part of the town, existing not just as a piece of our story, but as a genuine person. Of course, this means that when they do come into play in the story, everything feels a lot more honest as a result. All of these factors combine to create Greenvale, a small forest town with a past, with people running and walking and driving, with motives, dreams, death, 
birth, laughter, drama, and passion. They combine to create the foundations of the story that this game is about to tell, Setting up this location, the characters in the location, and placing it as a character in the story is essential before we actually find out what is happening. Having talked about the town itself, we can now talk about all of the things that there are to do in the town. I just want to note here that I will not be talking about every single side quest in the game. I'll just be talking about a few of them, and the overall concept of the side quests, and how they affect the game in general. This is mostly because there are a bunch of them, 50 in total, and while they all have some sort of consequence, it isn't necessary to go through every single one. It also wouldn't be very entertaining to just list off and include 50 missions. I will say though that these side missions are pretty integral to the whole experience. Of course, doing a simple side mission like the part-time jobs for the owners of the milk barn will get us rewards, like the increasing levels of cards that give us discounts for their store. We are always rewarded in some way, whether it's a weapon, a collectible trading card, or an upgrade to our car. But the rewards don't just come in the form of items that we could use in the game. These are temporary, and the information that we receive, both about the characters, the case at hand, and the world, are forever. Side quests in Deadly Premonition usually give us some larger context of the world. These can be quite integral to the entire experience. Getting better knowledge on the people of the town and the case at hand can make things make a lot more sense. Also, going through and completing every side quest on a second or third playthrough will give us a lot more perspective. This game is full of incredibly small details that foreshadow the story. Even the big twists that appear are all laid out in some way, but we'll get to those in a bit. Part of the genius of the side content, though, is the mostly unserious nature of it all. We're normally doing things like the part-time job for the milk barn, playing darts, or finding and collecting human remains. Okay, maybe some of them are pretty serious, but in general they have a mostly lighthearted nature. The story rides this line as well, jumping back and forth between incredibly light, fluffy, and fun, back to serious, violent, and dark. This contrast is something that I believe the game takes from its inspirations, but it manages to juxtapose the two sides of this town. One, the lighthearted, sometimes funny and kitschy side of Greenvale. Huh? Sure, fire away, man. And the other, that's seemingly more recent. The one that surrounds this case, a murdered girl and a killer willing to snuff out someone seemingly innocent. Around the town, we can of course visit any of the shops to buy weapons, food, or coffee. Both food and coffee are essential to our journey. This is because in Deadly Premonition, we have a hunger meter and an energy meter. The longer we stay awake, the more both of these meters will decrease. This will eventually decrease our health as well if we get it low enough. Coffee will increase our energy and food will increase our health. We can also sleep back at the motel or at various smaller places around town. We also have to worry about gas in our cars, making sure that we fuel up whenever the meter gets low. Of course, we have access to all of the patrol cars in town, so we can always just find a new, already fueled up one. We can also shave at certain mirrors and bathrooms. If we don't do this, we'll eventually develop a pretty unruly beard. If we neglect changing our suit every couple of days, we'll also attract a horde of flies and become pretty stinky. A lot of this really is optional and isn't 100% necessary to move on, but honestly, these things are some of my favorite little touches to the game. I understand that some people won't like having to deal with things like gas and hunger, but honestly these little features, the parts of living the daily life of York, feel like they make the game special. I'm also a little partial to these kinds of features because games that give you the ability to do mundane things are always my favorite. Managing small tasks, doing little, almost nearly inconsequential activities always have some larger appeal. It adds a little bit of realism to the world. It also allows us to become one of the members of the town. Our schedule might not be as set in stone, but we have our own responsibilities to take care of. We have become a member of Greenvale, a part of the story, a part of the location, at least temporarily. 
We can also look for collectible trading cards throughout the town. These can be rewards from side missions. They can be hidden throughout the town or hidden in the main story. We can gain rewards from these later on, but they're mainly just extra collectibles. We can also go fishing by using a rod and some bait. Here we have to play a small mini game with a spinning row of icons. If we can manage to stop the marker on the pink gift box, we can get a trading card. We can also obtain fish, which can be caught or released. We can get ammo, items, food, lots of different things. There are many extra things to do around the town, lots of things that exist outside of the main story. There's so much here that I spent the first few days just wandering around and finding the things that I could get myself into. The town really is inviting. There's a lot hidden here, and you can spend so much time just wandering around, getting to know the place, or questioning suspects. On the first day, we can ask a ton of different people about the murder of Anna Graham. Anyone with a suspect sign over their head. But the story really begins when we finally head to the police station. As we arrive outside, York immediately respects the construction of the building. Upon entering, we are greeted by Thomas, the nervous and awkward sheriff's assistant. We need to take a look at Anna's file here, but it seems that Thomas has lost the key to the cabinet. We need to help him find it, which requires finding many wrong keys around the building before we eventually stumble upon the correct one. We can complete a short side mission here to help George find his dumbbell, as he does squats in his office with the worst form that I've ever seen. Usually when you do squats, you're supposed to swing your arms forward really far. Once we get the file, York goes over the details with Emily and Thomas in the conference room. Anna was a normal girl, 18 years old, worked at the local diner, and lived with her mother, Sally. Her father died in an accident when she was younger, and her mother currently lives off of the insurance money. Other than this tragedy, her life was usual. But York notes that this is exactly what a teenage girl doesn't want. The two officers note here that York's behavior is quite odd, and they even consider him a bit rude, attributing this to the fact that he's from the city. York then eats a biscuit on the table, one hand crafted and baked by Thomas himself. He gushes over the small dessert, noting how delicious it is. I think it's about time that we talked about something pretty important to Deadly Premonition. Twin Peaks. If you aren't aware, Twin Peaks was a television show created by David Lynch and Mark Frost in 1990. It had two seasons before being cancelled and then returned in 2017 for a third season. The show followed an FBI agent named Dale Cooper as he investigated the small town murder of Laura Palmer. The show's main appeal was from the surrealist nature of the town, characters, and strange forces behind everything. I dived into this quite a bit in my video on Alan Wake, noting the myriad of references that the game took from the show. In that video, I argued that the game took a lot of small things from Twin Peaks, but ultimately took from other sources as well and did its own thing with them. Now, I love Twin Peaks, but Deadly Premonition does not just take from Twin Peaks, it basically is Twin Peaks. As I said before in the development section, some reactions to the original trailer for Rainy Woods were very critical of this fact. There were two small dwarves in the Red Room originally referencing the arm from the show. The protagonist was originally named David Young Henning, who was a lot more similar to Agent Dale Cooper. And the sheriff originally looked a lot more like Sheriff Harry S. Truman from the show. But even though these changes were made, there are still a million small similarities left in the game. First of all, the general idea of the game, the crux of the plot, stands on the murder of a young girl in a small idyllic forest town, a place that is normally peaceful and is known for being a place where people don't have to worry about the unfeeling, uncaring violence of the world. The main character has a ton of similarities to Agent Dale Cooper. York speaks to Zack constantly, delivering his thoughts and feelings about the case at hand. This is very similar to Cooper, who speaks into a tape recorder, talking to the mystery woman, Diane. Diane, 11.30 a.m., February 24th. York also appreciates the food of the town. He obsesses about coffee, and he trusts in premonition to lead him in the right direction. Did you see that, Zack? Clear as a crisp spring morning. F. K. In the coffee. These are all things that make him very similar to Agent Dale Cooper. 
Anna Graham is very similar to Laura Palmer, a young girl from a small town that might have some secrets and a dark past. When we visit her home and speak to her mother, we can find her diary and some interesting things in her drawer. It's also worth noting that her mother dances with Anna's dress in the same way that Leland Palmer dances with Laura's picture. Mm, a woman that we'll meet later, the Pot Lady, shares some things with the Log Lady from the show. During a side quest, we can find a bag of red powder in a motorcycle tank, just like in the show, when James Hurley has drugs planted in his motorcycle tank. York even finds a red seed during the autopsy of Anna Graham, which strikes similarities to Cooper, finding the letter underneath Laura's fingernail in the show. It's worth even noting that Emily looks almost identical to Naomi Watts, a woman that has starred in Lynch films before and would oddly enough go on to be in the third season of Twin Peaks. Also, the Red Room is very similar to the Black Lodge from the show. These aren't the only things that this game shares with the show. Some of them are big reveals that we haven't reached in the story yet, especially a large character whose hair turns white later in the game to show a massive transformation. Now, it should be said that the game isn't just Twin Peaks. It definitely doesn't play out the same as the show, and even from the beginning, there are a lot of things that the game has that are completely its own. The culprit in that of the raincoat killer is completely original. A lot of the characters in the town do not share counterparts from the show. George Woodman, in particular, is no Sheriff Harry S. Truman. He doesn't quickly become York's friend. For a while, he's very much at odds with the agent. He doesn't trust him and doesn't want to follow his orders whatsoever. Emily, though she looks like someone else, isn't really that similar to anyone on the show, and represents someone completely new. In addition to that, once we get to a certain point in the game, it takes the plot in an entirely new direction, and by the end of the game, you will 100% realize that Deadly Premonition is its own thing entirely. It is not just Twin Peaks the video game. With that being said, the first few hours of the story can leave you feeling like you've seen this before if you know about the show. It rides the line of taking way too much, and this is coming from a massive fan of Twin Peaks. I've seen the show plenty of times, and I still hold the belief that Twin Peaks The Return is probably the best thing that has ever come out of television. But certain scenes just left me rolling my eyes. When you start the game, it just keeps going on and on. The references and similarities just keep coming. It becomes very tiresome very quickly. It was actually something that I found more annoying than the poor gameplay, clunky writing, or graphical issues. But if you can manage to get past the beginning sections, then you will realize what Deadly Premonition does with this concept is all its own, and is worth the slog if you're familiar with the show. The beginning is just sort of something that you have to push through a bit. It's also worth noting that Deadly Premonition flips back and forth between the serious, violent crime drama and a jokey, lighthearted tone much more frequently than Twin Peaks does. There's a lot of breathing room here from the evil in the beginning. It creates a very distinct style, and these are really the things that make Deadly Premonition. The style, what the story becomes, what it adds, all pull Deadly Premonition away from just being Twin Peaks in another medium. George interrupts York's review of the case file to tell him that the autopsy has been complete. We now need to head to the hospital, but we have a choice. We can either drive with Emily and George, or we can go by ourselves, allowing us to take care of some side tasks first. I, most of the time, always chose the second option, because more side activities are available in each chapter. George gets very upset every time we do this, though, and becomes angered by the fact that York doesn't want to follow their protocol. This doesn't really affect anything, though. We can still do whatever we want. We'll just receive a verbal lashing from George each time. When we do eventually head to the hospital, we can meet Fiona, the receptionist. She is reading a book called Liar's House, which happens to have the same plot as what's happening here in town. She tells us that the doctor is in the computer room, but when we arrive there, he is missing. He has left a chess puzzle for us to solve. It's not really much of a puzzle. The winning moves are listed, and we just have to select the pieces that are referenced in order. I guess this would be difficult if you didn't know the names of the pieces, but they're actually on posters around the room. 
This gives us a key card that allows us to access the morgue downstairs. Here we meet Dr. Usha Johnson. He fills us in on what he's found. The crime took place early in the morning, and Anna was gripping something in her right hand when she died. Ultimate cause of death, in the end, was blood loss. Johnson theorizes that the killer was a lonely individual and had issues with women, especially because Anna's tongue was cut out. We're then allowed to inspect the body ourselves. This gives us a closeness to the victim and the crime itself. We find a strange piece mark that was embedded in her hand and York deduces that she was crying while she died, killed inside under a roof. The killer sat with her for two hours before transporting her to the woods. York then finds a red seed in her mouth and adds these to the ones that he has found from other cases. This is all a part of a larger string of cases that York has been looking into, the details of which he can't reveal yet. Before he leaves the room, York solves Yusha's chess puzzle. When we walk outside, we are transported to the other world. These are most of the combat sections for the rest of the game. York will be taken to this Otherworld version of the area we are in, and have to take down enemies and find clues before exiting. This will bring York closer to the evidence that he needs. Finding the clues will allow us to piece together the scene, and eventually York will be thrown back into the real world. In the hospital, we only really have to find key cards to be able to leave. We meet Emily and George back in the lobby, and we're introduced to someone new. Harry is a man in a wheelchair that speaks in riddle through his aid. His father started the lumber trade in town, and Harry basically owns most of Greenvale. He gives York some advice, that haste won't bring him what he needs. He also tells him that the rain affects the state of the town. George thinks the man is obstructing their investigation. At this point, we have to go speak to the witnesses, the ones who found the body first. We head to the place that Anna was found, meeting Jim Green, the Forest Park Warden. His grandchildren, Isaac and Isaiah, were the ones that found the girl. York wants to ask them about what they saw, but everyone gets really upset at this idea. They're like genuinely pissed that he wants to ask them questions about the body. It's kind of wild and doesn't really make sense to me. It just seems like a normal thing that an investigator would do. There are a lot of these types of scenes early in the game where everyone seems to be treating York like he's this terrible, unfeeling person. He definitely is a bit tone deaf to other people's problems, but they make it out to be a lot worse than he really is. I think this is because they want us to not trust York right away and slowly develop a friendship with him over the course of the game. This is something we'll talk about a bit more in depth later on, but for now it's just something to point out. Talking to the kids does turn out to be important though. They aren't that shaken up by seeing Anna because they think she was a fairy, a goddess of the forest. When we head to the tree, the place her body was found hanging, we find four pieces of evidence. Two bent pieces of grass, a picture of a vest with holes, a missing piece of a pinheel shoe, and a chip with rusted metal dust. George has a theory about the murder, that the killer put shoes on the woman and was kneeling beneath her. York challenges this though with the evidence that we've just found. He was kneeling beneath her to pray because he thought she was a goddess. The broken heel comes from a third party that was here with the killer, a woman. Emily believes that the woman could be Diane, a woman that owns a local art gallery, because she's the only one that would wear shoes like that. She happens to be out of town right now though, so we'll have to return to that lead. The piece of metal that we found though has to have come from the old lumber mill. Once there, York requests to go in alone. He thinks that anybody in the town could be a suspect at this point, and it wouldn't be good police work to let them in with him. Inside, we once again enter the other world. We enter and find an altar with a mannequin placed on it. The first clue we happen upon is a reversed peace sign. We can also answer a call from the killer. Eventually, we find the other two clues, damaged red hair that was stuck in the elevator, and a peeled off fake fingernail. We have a small puzzle where we have to shoot a red hand from a tree that matches the one on the door behind us. We're then cornered by the killer and we get our first hiding sequence. Even though these sections are simple, they are really good at generating a lot of tension. Because of the way that combat works, like I said before, a lot of the tension from combat is removed. The little amount of horror and fear that are present in the project is here, in these hiding and chase sequences. 
The hiding sections will see us picking a spot and staying there while the raincoat killer tries to find us. We have to hold our breath when he's close or we'll be killed. Eventually he'll leave and then we enter our first chase sequence. Here we have to shake the left analog stick back and forth while hitting buttons to jump over obstacles, push things out of our way, or dodge attacks from the killer. Both of these things work really well to up the intensity of the game. The chase sequences especially get the blood pumping. It works well to also make us fear the killer. Seeing him in action gives us a better idea of who we're fighting against and what kind of power that he has. I also want to point out the odd camera angles here. In either of these sections, we will get to see a shot of York's location and also a small shot of the killer's location. This is just a wild choice from the designers, and honestly, I love it. It's got a ton of style, and you really don't see things like this done very often in games. Playing around with multiple angles and breaking the general structure of a game is just something that you certainly don't see enough in the medium, and it's honestly very welcome here. That being said, I think the screen real estate could be used a little better. A half and half setup probably would have worked with a little bit of adjustment to the angles and sizing of the shots. It just kind of bugs me that a lot of the screen isn't being used here. After we eventually make it away from the killer and head back down the elevator, he almost traps York and we have a pretty intense and strict QTE here that we have to complete, otherwise York's journey comes to an abrupt end. York then completes his profiling with all of the evidence at hand. We see shots and flashes of the murder taking place. Outside, we learn that the raincoat killer is actually an old folktale around the town. People in town close up shop on rainy days because of this. They don't even wear raincoats in general because the superstition and belief in this tale is so strong. After York's investigation, he has realized that the killer must have the reversed peace mark on their back. He decides to ask George and Emily to see their backs. George is pretty appalled by this and tries to protect Emily, but she thinks it's fine. Her back is clear, but George's is full of scars. Clearly no mark, but it reveals something about George's past, that there's more here than meets the eye. Maybe this is the reason that he's so mistrusting. After this, York decides to call a meeting of the townsfolk for the next day. Here he issues a warning for the people of Greenvale, recommending that they stay safe and vigilant, as the killer is still out there. Harry also makes an announcement through his aide. It's a cryptic one about fog covering the town. He tells York the same thing. He wants him to remove the fog that soils the place. He wants to chat with York more, but it isn't the right time yet. George once again takes a pretty aggressive approach and tries to push information out of him. We're then free to wander around the community center and talk to everyone that showed up. This is the game forcing us to be introduced to each character in the town if we haven't already met them yet. Of course, if we have been completing every side mission that we can, we'll have talked to most of these people before, but it's still a good way for the game to make sure that we know who the players on this stage are, even if they aren't going to be integral to the story. We can meet Quint, a local mechanic who's in a relationship with Becky and happens to be delivering red powder for someone. Brian the Insomniac is the local gravekeeper who's very odd. Carol is the owner of a local bar and is Thomas's sister. She was very close with Anna and seems like she's been very affected by her death. The General is the owner of the Scrapyard and was in Vietnam. He believes the story of the Raincoat Killer is not a myth and invites York to his business to talk more about it. We also find out from Keith and Lily that Becky has been acting strange and not showing up to work. We can meet Olivia, who runs the A&G Diner with Nick. We find out that Anna was a hard worker at the diner, but was also very unfocused the days after it rained. We also unlock the gun store here by talking to Wesley, the owner of Panda Bear. We can also talk to Polly, the pot lady, Jim, the gas station owners, but once we talk to everyone, we are allowed to leave. This whole sequence gives us a much better picture of the town in general. Not only does it give us a better idea of the reaction to Anna's death and the state of the town in the aftermath, it allows us to examine each person individually. Here we can see if they meet our profile of the criminal that may have done something like this. It's a good way to cement every character into the story and let them take shape in the mystery to come. After all of this, Emily invites York to dinner with her, George, and Thomas. 
Here, York ends up telling a very grotesque story about a previous murderer that he caught. It makes everyone in the group very uncomfortable, especially with how nonchalant he is about it. York's statements about crime are pretty poignant here, though. Ugh, I give up. I can't compete with you. Don't say that, Emily. The cases you have solved are all full-fledged crimes. A crime is a crime. Size doesn't matter. There is no big and small. After we head back to the hotel, York has a little wrap-up section on the chapter. This happens at the end of each chapter. York will review all of the things that he learned during the investigation. He will ask us, or Zach, questions about what happened to make sure that we retained information. Even if we get the questions wrong, it doesn't really matter. There is no punishment because if we're wrong, we just learn what actually happened. This is not a challenge section or a test, it's just reserved to make sure that we understand what's happening. York then reflects about the case in bed. We get another scene with the grandfather from the beginning context scene. The daughter wants to hear the rest of the story, begging for more details. Diane has arrived back at the art gallery and has been dropped off by a man that we haven't seen before. York is then back in the red room, and the angels ask him if he is thirsty. He has delivered coffee with milk by Anna. Becky is there as well, but only saying her name. York drinks the coffee and the door opens. York then arrives in the white room with the boy from before. He wakes up in bed and realizes that this case relates directly to him and Zach. As we leave the hotel room, we meet a man named Forrest Kaysen. He is a tree sapling salesman, and he apparently has the secret to sprouting specific saplings in this area. We're then picked up by George, who is ready to head to the art gallery, as Diane is back in town. When we get inside, we see a massive sculpture in the lobby. Olivia is here, admiring some art, but when we try to talk to her, she hurries away. We can pick up a note and key that she drops. This is essential to solving the puzzle of the gallery. We have to find three different paintings, all noting a different number of trees, that will give us a code to enter a deeper part of the building. York will overhear an argument in Diane's office. Carol storms out after saying that she is taking something. Diane explains this, saying that she and Carol have a pretty tenuous relationship. Diane was apparently after a man that Carol loved. Diane has an alibi for the crime, though. She was at the bar while the murder was happening. She isn't a prime suspect at this point, but our next goal is to try and confirm this story with Nick at the diner, because Diane was at the bar with him. When we head to the diner, it becomes less of an investigation and more of a lunch date with Emily. During this lunch, Harry arrives and picks up his regular order, a turkey sandwich with strawberry jam and cereal. York refers to this as a sinner's sandwich. He ends up trying the sandwich and loves it. Emily then gets a little personal with York, revealing that she moved here from Seattle. She was bullied in town because she wore different clothes than everyone else. They started to spread rumors about her that she slept with everyone. This caused her to not be on a personal level with a lot of the folks that live here. York reveals that he also dressed like a punk rocker when he was young, surprising Emily greatly. York eventually questions Nick, who claims that he was with Diane when the murder took place. They were talking about artists, Rembrandt and Turner specifically. We can talk to Nick's wife who says that she was at the diner when everything happened. She isn't into art and Nick often seeks solace in Diane's words relating to things like this. York then brings back the fact that Olivia was at the gallery when he first arrived. This doesn't make any sense if she doesn't like art. Now that we know she's hiding something, she decides to talk to the two out back. After the diner closes, we can talk to her. She reveals that Nick resents her for not having the same interests as him. She ended up following the pair and believes that Diane saw her following them as her eyes flashed in the dark. The day after this, Anna was found dead. Olivia was at the gallery earlier to confront Diane, but she ended up calling it off. At this moment, Quint calls in something happening at Becky's house. Thomas has already been sent there and he said something about the raincoat killer. We're then sent to Becky's house. Quint is so distraught about Becky that he can't speak. When York enters, we get another Otherworld sequence. We are immediately attacked by the raincoat killer as we enter. We then see red velvet on the bed in the safe room. The first clue we find is the reversed peace sign. A red seed is the second clue, and the third is a bloody camisole. 
When we finally enter the bathroom, we find Becky hung up by an intricate system of strings. She turns out to be still alive, and George cuts the strings to let her down, even though York tells him not to. York ends up seeing Anna in the woods. Before she dies, Becky coughs up a key. This turns out to be for the safe in Becky's bedroom. She had a note there for her sister, who we now learn is Diane. Becky had fallen for a man that was following her. This was the killer, and Becky ended up finding Anna's body. She wouldn't let go of an object in her hand for the killer, but she would for Becky. She took the locket that she was holding. She had borrowed a pair of heels from Diane when she went to the tree, which is the reason for the prints and the broken heel at the crime scene. Since then, Becky has stayed inside to avoid the killer. She gave the locket to the twins, Isaac and Isaiah, to keep it safe. Our next goal is to see Lily, the twins' mother. Before this, we see a scene of Forrest playing with the kids. We head to the milk barn to talk to Lily, who tells us that Becky stopped coming into work after Anna was killed. Lily ended up taking the twins over to cheer her up, and she gave them a small box. We head to the community center to see the kids. They tell us that Carol tried to take the box from them. They were supposed to take it to Diane, though, and Carol ended up getting it from Diane after they delivered it. They have to tell the kids that Becky ended up as a goddess of the forest. This leads York to tell Zack that he hopes Emily doesn't become a goddess of the forest. Back at the station, York wants to look more into Diane. He thinks that the next lead is looking into Diane and Nick's relationship. He sends the department to follow both Nick and Diane anywhere they go. York heads to the bar to stake them out, but Nick leaves alone. Diane never showed up. We can follow him back to the gallery, but York almost crashes on the way and loses Nick. When we get there, George says that Nick never showed up. He's also had a drink to take off the edge. We have to find another entrance into the gallery, which is an underground pathway behind the building. Here we have to fight our first crawler, probably the most annoying enemy in the game. These things cling to the walls and the ceiling. When we shoot them, they will stop taking damage and become slightly invisible, jumping to another wall. They'll do small energy attacks that we can dodge. I do like the fact that an enemy was eventually introduced that adds some sort of complexity to combat, but fighting these things is incredibly slow and tedious. It becomes a bit easier and faster when we're using something like the shotgun, a weapon that does a lot more damage to them, but chasing them around the walls with the submachine gun or pistol is gratingly slow. Once we arrive in the gallery, we have to complete a puzzle concerning apples. We place each apple in front of a painting with a man that represents the apple's state. A child, a young man, or an old man. We then find three clues, a red seed, a broken stiletto heel shoe, and a large reversed peace sign. Once we reach the real world, Nick is passed out in the lobby and Diane has already been attacked by the killer, hanging above the statue. George and Emily are let in and York barely manages to catch Diane from falling onto the statue and impaling herself. George catches the both of them, but not after trying to push the massive sculpture over by himself. Thomas sends for an ambulance, but Diane is alive and walks around with her tongue cut out, monologuing about the sculpture before them. George tries to arrest Nick for attempted murder, but the sculpture falls over. Emily is almost crushed along with Diane, but York saves her. Diane is killed, and the raincoat killer has claimed his third victim. Then Forrest's dog, Willie, arrives. He guides us through the art gallery and leads us back to Diane's room. Here, we find that Forrest has been trapped in a hidden door. He was drinking with her, and she locked him inside. Nick doesn't really give any leads as he's still in shock. He apparently was knocked out while waiting for Diane. George then invites us to go drinking. This is a pretty big scene for the game and its story. Up until this point, George hasn't really trusted York. He started out pretty aggressive and really didn't want to follow along with anything York had to say. He viewed him as a city cop, someone that didn't understand Greenvale's way of life or its customs. An outsider come to intrude on their peaceful land, their quiet, idyllic town pushed into by a big-time cop. When we try to leave and go do side content, George gets upset. When we try to question the kids, or when York asks to see the officer's backs, George is upset. He even gets upset when delivering the news that the autopsy results are ready. He's always very firm, very staunch. But here, getting drinks with George, he decides to open up. He tells York about the scars on his back, 
They come from his mother. She would call it the tree punishment when he did something bad. This affected George greatly and has colored his life. He apologizes for not following York's orders. He promises to do so from now on. Now, York has finally got George on his side in this investigation. York can also speak to Carol here at the bar. He asks her about the locket, but she ignores him and heads up to the stage to sing. York then gets to spend some quality time with Emily. She shows up in a nice dress, and York is stricken by her beauty. This causes George to leave, and Emily reveals that he asked her out when they were younger, and she turned him down. She talks about her past as well. Her dad was a stockbroker and was gone a lot. Her mother died of cancer when she was young. She gave her a brooch that she takes wherever she goes to this day. York then heads back to the hotel, and while he thinks the night is over, Emily arrives. They continue their conversation from earlier, but this time York talks about his past. York's father was a federal agent and a harsh man. I had a vivid imagination, and I remember he once said this to me. There are plenty of crazy things in this world. You don't have to go dreaming them up. And it's my job to make sense out of them. One day you'll understand what I'm saying. His mother baked a lot, causing him to have a great passion for sweets. Emily then finally asks about Zack. York says that Zack is his best friend. He's been there since he was a kid. We then see flashes to York's childhood. His father held a gun to his mother and told York, at times we must purge things from this world because they should not exist, even if it means losing something that you love. When York came back to his senses, they were both dead. It was around this time that Zack manifested. We then see Nick begging to be let out of jail, but Thomas is nowhere to be found. We see Carol and another woman at some sort of dominatrix lair. We are then in the white room, and a mystery man tells York that if he enters the door ahead, there is no turning back. Young York then relives the scene from his childhood. We then see another non-canon framing scene. The young girl seems to be scared of what she's hearing. It seems like kind of a violent and graphic story to be telling a child. There's a red plant in the room as well. The next morning, York is having a cup of coffee at the hotel. The cup makes a ring on the newspaper spelling out the words hurry and Harry. York realizes he needs to go see the man in the wheelchair immediately. On our way out, we find out that Thomas has gone missing and George is going to look for him. At Harry's mansion, we're forced to solve the puzzle before we can talk to him. The puzzle is pretty simple. We find a music sheet with specific numbers. We have to collect umbrellas that match the numbers and then place them in statues. Harry ends up giving York another task before he'll reveal anything. He tells York that the red seeds in the town are found in a very specific place. We must find it and then return to him. This place is the graveyard where we can find piles of red seeds. Returning to Harry's, we have another puzzle, sliding statues into place on a grid. We then find the man in a massive room in his mansion. Harry then reveals nearly everything, bringing us up to speed on the knowledge that he holds. The seeds are incredibly powerful, and a massive mystery surrounds them. There was an event that took place in the town 50 years ago. Shortly after the clock tower was constructed, the event involving the raincoat killer took place. The military had something to do with it, and a gag order was issued, which is why the event doesn't show up in the FBI's database. There's clearly more to the story, details which we don't know yet. Harry directs York to the sheriff's station. The sheriff that was in charge at the time of the event hated the military, and he did his own investigation, so there should be a file in there somewhere. When we get back to the station, George and Emily both think that Harry is messing with them, but George lets York look for the files anyways. We have another Otherworld sequence where we find a broken safe which dates back to the 50s, dried drops of water, and a red seed on a desk. This all points to the fact that someone has very recently moved the files that we're looking for, and it could only be one person, Thomas. York then decides to trust his premonition one more time by having Emily get him a cup of coffee. The cup she happens to bring him is advertising Velvet Falls, so the group heads there. Here we fish up the documents that we're looking for. Inside is a guide on how to obtain immortality. 
The person who wants to gain immortality must make four sacrifices on four different rainy nights. The sacrificed individuals have to eat the red seeds beforehand, and they cannot speak while they are being killed. The handwriting matches Thomas's, but with the documents in hand, we might be able to wrap up the mystery with more information from Harry. So we make one final trip back to Harry's mansion, once again navigating through the other world in his home, and finally gaining access to a secret underground monitoring room that he has built. He then finally tells us the truth. The night that the clock tower was finished, his parents were arguing. He was young at the time and decided to climb the clock tower to see the town from above. When he did, he found the military pumping a purple fog over the town. When the clock tower rung for the first time, he ran. The bell rang 13 times in total, and he saw people going mad in town, swarming the place. He was able to overcome the purple fog, but others weren't. He then saw the man in the red raincoat and realized that it was his father. He was knocked out, and when he woke up, he found his mother dead. The military swarmed the town after the event and a gag order was issued. Now, Harry believes that the town retains the fog inside of its soil, and every time that it rains, a little bit seeps out, maddening the people here. The seeds are also connected to this in some way, affecting the nervous system when consumed. Before we leave, Harry tries to take it all back, saying it was just gibberish and he wasn't serious. He then tells York one more thing, saying the exact same line that York's father did. At times we must purge things from this world because they should not exist. Even if it means losing someone that you love. He also gives some pretty poignant advice to the agent, that no one thing can maintain its shape for all eternity. As we leave the mansion, Emily arrives, stating that they found Thomas at his apartment. When we arrive, he's already gone. York thinks that the man has unfinished business in town, and that he won't leave yet. As we leave, we see Anna's ghost, and she guides us to the Galaxy of Terror. Inside, the other world creeps in. We find clues relating to Thomas throughout the building and eventually uncover a secret room downstairs. Here, we find the locket that was given to the twins, and York is knocked out by Thomas in a dress. Seemingly, Thomas was the one behind the killings. It was him we were looking for all along. After York is knocked out, we play as the younger version of him, chasing his father through the forest. He is eventually calmed down by Emily and Willie, Forrest's dog. York is then present in the Red Room. All of the women that have been killed are here, as well as the angels. York is holding a doll version of Forrest. The trees begin to crack and spill out filth. We then jump back to the grandfather telling the story. He calls the young girl Emily, and the man's face has been revealed to look like York, but older. Back in the story, York has been kidnapped. He's starting to realize that he really cares about Emily. We will play Emily in this sequence as she looks for York. She follows Willie and Forrest as they use York's cigarette scent to try and find him. We also jump back to York's POV as he thinks about Emily and hopes that she isn't killed. Thomas will also pop in at certain points speaking about destiny and eventually telling York that the next person that walks through the door will determine his fate. It seems that Emily is the last sacrifice needed for the ritual. Three women have already been killed, and she could be the last. Willie eventually leads us to the clock tower where York is being kept. Emily has to ascend the place, and this late into the game, we actually get our first boss battle. We have to shoot Thomas as he jumps across the clockwork gears. He moves around quite a bit, and it can be difficult to get a shot off on him. He will also attack, swinging hooks from the tower at Emily. We can dodge these with some easy button presses. Eventually, he's taken down. Emily tries to get Thomas to come down from there to give this all up, and he seems to have a moment of clarity. But he tries to attack one final time, and Willie saves Emily as Thomas is impaled on one of the hooks. York is then freed by Willie and reunited with Emily. She brings him up to speed, telling him that Thomas was the real murderer, but York is not so certain. There's one more twist in this story, because the real killer was actually George all along. Thomas actually has alibis for all of the murders, and he has no peace symbol carved into his back. George is covered with scars and has no alibi for any of the murders. Emily is shocked by this fact, but if we look back at the things that happened, it was under our nose the entire time. There are a ton of little details in the game that hint towards George far before we find out this twist. First of all, his general demeanor is aggressive towards that of someone looking into the murders. At first, we just write this off as someone who is mistrusting of outsiders, but in retrospect, it makes too much sense. 
Also, George's backstory reveal in the bar could be viewed one of two ways. When we first hear it, we may be inclined to believe that George is opening up, trusting York, and revealing his troubled past, explaining his anger. But when we know that he is the killer, it really just contextualizes his relationship with women. This is something that's hinted at all the way back in the autopsy scene when looking over Anna's body. George the perpetrator is just like you. He's passionate about women. There are tons of other clues all over town. The fact that some of the only red trees in the game are in the graveyard, but also the sheriff's department and George's house. George's house also has one of the only places that we can't peek inside. His license plate will also say, I am the one, or he is the one, depending on which version of the game we're playing. The biggest spit in our face, though, is the fact that George dealt the killing blow to both Diane and Becky right in front of us. He cuts the wires that kill Becky, even though York tells him not to. He also pushes over the statue that kills Diane. At the time, we just view this as George trying to help and maybe making a mistake in the end, but in reality, this was him finishing the job, playing the role of the big bumbling idiot. These aren't even all of the details that the game includes, but it holds nothing back. And this is a risky thing for a story to do. Putting huge details into the story that reveal the big twist runs the risk of making the twist too obvious. But the reward is that the punch is that much harder, because it was there all along. I won't say that the twist is the best thing ever, and a lot of the time you could have figured it out beforehand. But the story does try its hardest to make George have some sort of arc beforehand, making us doubt our suspicions that it's him. I really wasn't sure who it was before the reveal. At times I thought it was Thomas, other times I thought it was George. I suspected Nick, Forrest, even York himself in some weird warped way. But this isn't nearly the end of the story, or even the last reveal that the game has left in store. At this point, York heads back to the sheriff's department. It has now turned into the other world once again. We find a key for a hidden room in George's office. This leads to a secret lair downstairs and one of the cells. Down here, we find Carol's earrings and a massive peace sign painted on the ceiling. Carol is here and it seems George has already gotten to her. She writes in blood that she was a substitute, that George's original target was Emily. Before she dies, she stuffs red seeds into Emily's mouth. York sends her with Forrest to the hospital so that she can have her stomach pumped. As they leave, the killer invites York inside of the station. The place has changed. We have to chase the killer through the place. We eventually head up a set of massive, colossus-sized stairs in a hollow chamber. We're finally face to face with the killer, George Woodman. He tells York about his fascination with the seeds, and with Emily specifically. He believes that these two things are the treasures that the town holds. He originally found the seeds when chasing a deer through the woods. He found that it was incredibly strong and could not be felled. This is when he found the power and uses them now, eating handfuls to cement his transformation. We then have our boss fight with him. He will attack us from afar and also up close, but the only way that we can damage him is to shoot the peace sign on his back. After we defeat him here, he talks about the girls and how he framed Thomas. He then goes through a full transformation, turning into a hulking beast with spectral hair. He truly looks like a final boss that we'd fight in a Tekken game. We fight him similarly here, and when he is finally defeated, he begins to revert to his childlike state. He is begging his mother to stop beating him. He says something that points to someone else being behind this, someone that made him do this. York then takes out the locket, which enrages George. Only the Chosen One can hold the locket, and as he tries to toss his axe at the agent, he shoots it, deflecting it back at George. He is finished, killed for good. We then play young York once more in the hallway of the Red Room. Everyone is here waiting to give York advice. The angels, the dead women, Thomas, and even his parents. We then see Emily and Harry in the White Room. York opens an envelope and wakes up in the hospital. Usha gives him the same envelope. It's a letter from Forrest with a location, George's house. There's a bigger mystery here yet that still hasn't been solved. There, we find George's secret room in the basement. A hidden compartment reveals his mother's corpse and a picture of him and Forrest. A message scrawled on the picture invites York to the theater. We realize that Kaysen was behind everything the entire time. If it wasn't a reversed peace mark. Red.
Red tree. This reveal plays similarly to the reveal that George was behind the killings. Kaysen has been all too friendly every time that we've seen him. He has also been involved in a lot of crucial events, especially being present for Diane's murder. He also happens to sell saplings, red saplings, with red seeds. He has the secret to growing these trees, a secret that is about to be revealed shortly. Before this, we play the raincoat killer in the flashback 50 years ago. We have to make it to the clock tower before the 13th bell. We see the gas being spread across the town and realize that Kaysen was there even then, looking like he hasn't aged a day. York is at the theater, and everyone in town has begun to turn, even the kids. York is transported to the White Room and is told that this is the point of no return, as what follows will serve as the finale for this tale. Inside, Emily has been infected by the trees that Kaysen has planted. This is truly the secret to growing the saplings. George was just a pawn the whole time, manipulated by Kaysen. Kaysen kisses Emily and she is disgusted. She stands up, revealing the tree is growing inside her stomach. York then asks Zack for help. He remembers the fight with his parents. This time, he realizes what actually happened. Kaysen was there, and the tree was sprouting in his mother's stomach. His father was going to kill her to save them. His mother wanted to die. This is when he says the line that has been a constant thread and theme throughout the game. At times, we must purge things from this world because they should not exist. Even if it means losing someone that you love. This statement is now entirely recontextualized. His father could not kill her. He failed and took his own life. We now see this statement as a warning, advice for the future, telling his son to do what he could not. But his son was not York. It was Zack. When Zack was knocked out by Kaysen, he found himself in a white room. York appeared and took over for him because he couldn't handle what had happened. The reverse happens now. York doesn't know what to do and Zack takes over. They've now switched roles. York is the one in Zack's head. Zack decides to do what his father couldn't and purge this thing from the world, but he misses his shot. Emily then takes matters into her own hands and rips the sapling from her stomach. This causes her to die and Zack sees her go off with the other women in the forest. York is there with them. It's up to Zack now. Kaysen then transforms and we have our first of three final boss fights. Kaysen swings along the theater, curling into a ball and hurling himself at Zack. We have to dodge these attacks and pump bullets into him when we can. It's a pretty easy fight overall. He then transforms once again. He has a small line here revealing that Harry also hides out in the White Room, somewhere that Kaysen can't access. He transforms again into a massive slimy creature. The second phase of this fight sees us running away from Kaysen in our final chase sequence. We then find ourselves in an otherworldly space, a clock tower. The roof is ripped off, and our final fight is a massive Kaysen. He will smash the platform, sending waves of energy out at us. But we can't attack him directly. We have to hit the doll of himself that he holds in his hand. At the end of the fight, he will put the doll in his pocket. We have to climb his arm when he attacks and get an angle on the doll to deliver the final shot. He is destroyed by Zack as he walks away from him. This is his final revenge, getting justice on the man that took the lives of his parents. He's also dropping the hammer on the man that took Emily from York, his best friend. Kaysen is kind of left as an enigma. He is some otherworldly power, something that clearly exists across time. He doesn't age. He is incredibly powerful. His dog, Willie, also has something of a role in this too. When we talk to Kaysen as Emily, he says that Willie has been there as long as he could remember. An interesting fact is that the map of Greenvale is actually shaped like Willie the dog. Swery had stated in interviews that they originally planned to extrapolate on these characters further, but they had to cut those things from the final game. As Kaysen is destroyed, crowds of people gone mad in the town have begun to turn to lucidity again. Zack speaks to Emily's body, telling her to propose to York, as he might be too nervous to do so. 
Zack is back at Harry's house, looking at the painting of the women now gone. Harry then drops the massive bomb that George was his son. His father was the original raincoat killer, and his son was the second one. Harry was also faced with the same predicament that Zack's father was. He was unable to take his wife's life, and even worse, his own. Zack succeeded where he could not. When Zack heads out of town, he sees Emily in the forest. He stops the car and finds the twins inside. They are talking to someone that Zack can't see. Emily told them to give him something. There's a touching send-off here to York and Emily. Emily really likes you, Zack. She really likes you. No, she doesn't. Not me. She really likes that guy, York. The guy you see standing next to her. They are together now, in another place, somewhere else, somewhere better. Zack tells York that he realized why George carried Anna into the woods, because he wanted the twins to find her. When we get back to the hotel, we can choose to leave or stay. Leaving brings the conclusion to the game, and staying allows us to complete any side activities that we might have missed. Leaving means goodbye for Zack and York, as York is staying here, with Emily, in the forest. On his way out, he decides not to smoke, and we see Willie trailing behind him with a case and doll in his mouth. We then see the story is complete, and we realize that this man in this room, Grandpa, is Zack. During the credits, we hear the girl and her mother talking. The girl's name is Michelle Louise Morgan, but Zack calls her Emily for some reason. Maybe because Emily has become her Zack now. We then see Emily and York in the diner and every casualty that happened in Greenvale. Zack finally joins them again. York tells us that new events have been cropping up in New Orleans, and it's time to investigate once more, setting up a sequel. This is furthered by the fact that on the new start screen, we can hear Michelle finding that Zack has gone missing somewhere. Now that the story of Deadly Premonition is over, we can talk about it as a whole. There are some things that this game does really right. For example, Zack. Zack is something that we haven't really talked about very much other than a brief introduction, and that's because I was saving it for the big reveal. Throughout the story, Zack has mostly existed as an off-screen character. He is someone that York confides in. Over the course of the story, we learn that the two are actually best friends. What we think is just a disembodied voice in York's head has really been there for most of his life, and has helped him through tough times. The team has stated that Zack could be viewed as a placeholder for the player themselves. We are meant to be Zack, and our view of York changes over the course of the game. The more we learn about him, the more we come to like York. The two lines run parallel, and Zack is a part of York that makes him more endearing to the player. This is because we are becoming closer to him. It's also worth noting that one of the only choices that we are allowed to make in the game is directly after Zack takes over. Once he is in control, we are in control. The player has now taken over. Up until now, we have been assisting York in the case, leading him in the right direction, helping him out. But when we take control, we are in the driver's seat. Having now seen the ending of the story and where everything goes, you can also see how far Deadly Premonition goes away from the Twin Peaks comparison. There were some wacky things that happened in the course of the show, but it never really reaches the heights of a man eating red seeds to reach his final form of a Jinpachi monster throwing a spectral axe at an FBI agent, or fighting a giant farmer in an ethereal clock tower area before his head sprouts a seed and explodes. The story definitely goes in directions that I would have never expected. I didn't really suspect Kaysen or George, not the entire time at least, and I never thought that we would get the emotional punch that is Zack taking over to carry the burden for York. The story surely is surprising, and I think one of the things that it does best is character. Because each person that we meet is well-developed, intricate, and filled with depth, they each matter in the story. This is without even talking about all of the side content. There's a particular side quest we can do for George to find his mother a flower. When we give it to him, we receive the radio, which lets us fast travel. But the context of this mission is wildly different when we beat the game. His mother was downstairs in the basement the entire time. 
every character from Emily to York and even Thomas or Olivia has their own part to play here. This makes the mystery that much more compelling. A good mystery is a difficult thing to juggle. It can't be too telegraphed, but it can't come out of nowhere. It has to be seen and not seen at the same time. But having good character is integral to this. Making the characters matter in the course of the story is what makes or breaks a good mystery. And character is where Deadly Premonition truly shines. Deadly Premonition is a game that's been a bit overlooked throughout the years. Sure, now it's looked back on as a cult classic. People have managed to look past the lower points of the project to see how it really shines. I've talked a lot about both sides of this game, but I've heavily focused on the things that this game does right. This is mostly because the game wasn't very well received at first, and it took a bit of time for people to come around to it. But Deadly Premonition is not perfect. There are many things that it does poorly. Like we talked about previously, the combat is very forgettable. It exists as an obstacle in the way of the story, rather than something that the player is happy to participate in. It's something that we want to be done with so we can see more of what's happening, to reveal more of the truth behind the town and its mysteries. These issues extend to the structure of the game as well. Pretty quickly, the game devolves into the same repeated cycle over and over. We investigate someone, are told to go to a location, and journey into the other world. Here we look for three or four clues, fight through bullet sponges, and come out on the other side. We do the same things over and over. By the end of the game, the other world becomes more of a chore rather than something interesting, scary, or building tension. The gameplay is kind of saved at the end by the boss battles that we get to experience. Certain special sequences like playing as Emily or the Raincoat Killer serve to spice things up a bit and break up the pace of the game, but for most of the project, we're left with a pretty redundant gameplay loop. And of course, there are some goofier parts of the game. These are left up to preference for the most part, and I think a lot of people find charm in this. I did as well, but some of the time it felt like the game was breaking its own tension when it could have utilized it to more success. And as I said before, the myriad of Twin Peaks references for the beginning half of the game left me feeling tired. At first it was charming, and then it became exhausting. On top of this list of cons, there's also the fact that it can be difficult to find a version of the game that's easy to play, one that runs at a decent frame rate and also doesn't have a ton of graphical issues. With all of that being said, Deadly Premonition is a game that I would still recommend playing. And you know that you're playing something special when, even with all of these issues, it still manages to impress. Deadly Premonition automatically gets points in my book for being so unique. With its inspirations worn not just proudly on its sleeve, but all over its body, it still manages to create its own story. It creates characters that you want to know, that you feel for, and want to see succeed. At the end of the day, you want to see York win. You are invested. You want him to finally get his happily ever after. You want to see the evil ones taken down and watch the cycle finally break. The town is incredibly intricate and well made. Just driving around this place gives you the impression that it was made with love and soul, and the attention to detail here is just astounding. There's a massive list of little hints and details in this game that developers had to know most people would never see. There are so many little things to the story and game that I didn't even talk about in this video that would have increased the length to three hours or so. Putting this level of detail into a game means that the people that really care about the project will be rewarded with more information, more content, or little interactions. Most people that play the game will not see this. They will skate right by it. But when these details are implemented in a game, it shows you that the people who made it really cared. They wanted people to interface with their game as deeply as they could. They wanted the player to care about it as much as they did. At the end of the day, I really enjoyed my time with the game, and I would highly recommend checking it out. When Deadly Premonition released, it led sales charts for the Xbox 360 in North America for a short period of time. Despite this, it was still not commercially successful. The critical reception for the game was incredibly mixed. It currently holds the Guinness World Record for the most critically polarizing survival horror game. Scores from the game ranged from a 2 out of 10 to a 10 out of 10. With all of this, a sequel to the game wasn't exactly in the cards, but with the passage of time, the game was allowed to be seen in a better light, and eventually, someone decided that a sequel to the first game might be a profitable endeavor. But we'll talk about that next time. Bye, Dad.